Right, here's a fun little one. Now, when we were creating our empire at the start of the game, we had the choice of selecting our own homeworld. Now, when we were given a choice of planetary types, we were given a selection of nine planets in total. That was essentially three focused on heat, desert worlds, uh, three focused on water or ocean worlds, uh, and then three focused on um, frozen-based planets, so like uh, Arctic ones or Tundra ones. But here's the interesting thing. There is in total, if you include different types of star, uh, 40 different types of planet in Stellaris. Now, that may come to a bit of a surprise to you. Um, what I have decided to do here is I've used the console commands to actually show you every type of planet that is available. There is only uh, a limited amount of planets in this solar system, so you, there is only a small range of planets to be seen. But let's quickly go through them all. So first of all, you have desert worlds, dry climates. These were one of the ones that we saw in the initial makeup at the start of the game, so I'm not actually going to read through this description here. Um, next one is a tropical world. Again, another one we saw at the start of the game. So I'm not going to go through this one here either. Arid worlds, again, the same here. Uh, this one has actually got an anomaly on it, signs of battle. So, but yeah, essentially it is an arid world. Uh, it's a sort of there. It was dry climate. This one is a wet climate. And um, desert worlds are dry climates. Next one along is this one here. Ocean worlds, another wet climate one. Continental worlds, another wet climate one. Frozen climates, a tundra worlds. Arctic worlds, another frozen climate. And alpine worlds, another frozen planet. Which leaves, I think, in the grand scheme of the worlds, just ours. Which is a savanna world, which is a desert planet. Um, alpine worlds, gas giants. Now, gas giants aren't solid bodies. As you can see here, a class 12 asteroid orbits... This, oh, this one's got an asteroid in orbit. That's a... Um, that is an anomaly. So... Gas giants, gaseous planet with an atmosphere primarily composed of hydrogen and helium surrounding a dense core. You can't inhabit gas giants. You can sometimes terraform them. This one here I can't. But that's a gas giant. It doesn't actually isn't classified as any of the three main categories of planet. It's only its own category. Um, asteroids. Sure enough, asteroids are also their own category. They are large asteroid, planetoid, um, standing out in the dense cluster of smaller bodies. They're some Normally they're very mineral rich. You can't generally inhabit them. Sometimes you can put habitats around them as well. Um, but typically you can't live on them. Next one up, a crystalline ent a entity, a crystalline asteroid. A large asteroid covered in some kind of crystalline outcroppings. Again, it's in its own category of planets. Uh, you can't typically inhabit them. As you can see, habitability is zero. Uh, we have another hot world. We have molten worlds. Molten worlds are rocky worlds that are scorching hot. The atmosphere is thin or non-existent, and the lava from the interior flows freely due to constant volcanic eruptions. This type of planet cannot sustain organic life. Here we go. Nice cool little molten world. Next one is a barren world. I believe these two here are actually both barren worlds. Yep. So barren worlds are rocky worlds with a thin or non-existent atmosphere. The surface is covered by meteor impacts and craters and completely devoid of life. Again, this is typically if, if disaster strikes most planets, uh, short of them being uh, hit by a nuclear attack, they typically resort to barren worlds. If things things go wrong, they just become barren. Uh, they can sometimes also be terraformed into more usable planets. Uh, this is a nice big toxic world, a rocky planet with a th thick atmosphere that has that is lethal to all known higher forms of life. 
it's a cool little green flow of a planet going on here. Uh, that's a toxic world. Now, if I come across to this system, I believe it is. Uh, let's just observe. Here we go. We can see these other types of planets. So we have a frozen world. Frozen worlds are a rocky world covered in a thick layer of permanently frozen ice, low temperatures, and very thin atmosphere uh, precludes the existence of life on the surface. Again, habitability 0%. We have a tomb world. Now, tomb worlds are, are really cool. A rocky world with a nitrogen oxygen atmosphere. It is currently experiencing a nuclear winter with dense layers of sooty aerosols in the atmosphere. High levels of surface radiation, minimal signs of life. Sometimes when a primitive culture reaches the nuclear age, they just decide we're going to start experimenting with nuclear bombs. And it all goes wrong and they blow up their own planet. They become what are known as tomb worlds. They, you may find them across the galaxy and sometimes on the surface. This one particularly is blank because it's uh, one I've created. But sometimes on the tomb worlds you'll actually find there's still structures from the, the empire that did exist there beforehand. Um, that's the cool little thing about tomb worlds. Now, how's this for a funky looking thing? This is a shielded world. The entire world is encased in some kind of impenetrable energy barrier. It blocks all scans on the surface. How cool does that thing look, eh? Once your science vessel comes along and scans this planet, you will find that it is a shielded one. Uh, you will be able to do a type of research that will break the shield, essentially. Uh, and then you'll get a series of different types of events that happen. Sometimes you'll get a small fleet that's in orbit of the ship, uh, um, the actual planet, and they've just been trapped inside the shield. Um, sometimes they'll start attacking you. Sometimes there's life on the planet that wants to escape. There's loads of different options, but that's a shielded world. Shielded worlds are, are event worlds. There will be a story behind them. Uh, they don't appear very often. Uh, they appear only in particular uh, empires in the game. Once if if there is that particular type of empire in existence in the game, uh, I believe it's normally xenophobic empires they actually start appearing in. Um, so you don't actually see them a huge amount, but when they do, when you do, they are pretty cool. Uh, next up is a machine world. Machine worlds are created by machine empires. Uh, its habitability is actually 0% for this particular one. If you're a machine empire, that will obviously be higher. Uh, machine empires when they work on machine worlds actually get a bonus the amount of resources they can generate so but they can't support any type of organic life they are completely changed to maximize the efficiency of any types of machines Ooh, how about this shrouded world now shrouded worlds our sensors are unable to penetrate the thick fog surrounding this planet ships that enter it do not return it's a cool little thing again I'd heed the call. Don't send anything there. If you do, you're not going to get it back. <laughs> uh, next up is a Gaia world. Gaia worlds are the premier choice of planets to inhabit. Typically, they have a huge amount of planet size. So as you can see here, this one has every type of planet tile available to it. Um, not to mention the fact that habitability for organic life, uh, even machine life actually, is 100%. It is a lush, well, you see here, an ideal temperate world with a nitrogen oxygen atmosphere and a resilient ecosystem. Optimal conditions for all known higher forms of life at different latitudes. Now, one thing you need to bear in mind is Gaia worlds are the choice of world for um, some of the fallen empires that claim them as holy worlds. If they're claimed as holy worlds, you don't generally want to inhabit them because it means the fallen empire is probably going to come over and say, no, I want you off this planet. I am looking after it. <laughs> uh, next up is a actual segment of a ring world. Now, ring worlds, you can get at the start of the game. You can actually get them as inhabited or inhabitable, uh, damaged, um, you can get a variety. I think it's five different types of ring worlds. But essentially, it, you can see this here is essentially a link of the ring world. 
once you got it up set, set up correctly, it is in a big ring. Um, their inhabitability is, again, it's normally 100%. Let's have a read here. Oh, an immense band. An immense band encircling the system's sun built to allow numerous artificial habitation zones along the inner span, freed from the restrictions and mundanity of planet-bound spherical existence. So, like I say, again, because I've created this, it's only a single segment of the ring world, but normally they are around the center of the galaxy. Now, this cool little center of the galaxy is actually a, uh, a pulsar. There are I think I've covered everyone. I'll just quickly double check. Yeah, that's all of the planets. This is a pulsar. There's several different types of suns and stars. They don't generally meet a huge amount. If you do mouse over them, they if you do want a better explanation, they do normally explain them. Um, so, for example, red giant stars, uh, which are... Here we go. Class M stars. Uh, you don't normally get a lot of inhabitable planets. But you do generally get mineral-rich planets. You can tell just by looking at these on the outside. So if you see this system is a red one, then it's probably not going to have any habitable planets. You can tell, even if I go back to controlling my original empire, you can tell just by looking at some of the shapes of these, the types of solar system they are. So small dots are generally the red dwarf systems. Bigger dots are normally the the white um, pulsars. Sorry, they're normally the, the the white or the yellow class K stars. Um, you can tell black hole systems immediately before you've even got there. So there we go. That's a black hole system. Uh, and normally, I think you can actually tell pulsar systems. I think maybe. Normally you can see the type of star that it is and from that assumption sometimes you may visit a system You don't want to survey it because you know, it's not going to be of anything use because the type of um, Anomaly or the type of thing at the center of that system is Meaning that there's going to be nothing of use in that solar system. So if we just play around with this a little bit We'll go back to this So this is now currently a pulsar and if we change it to Um, we'll change this now to a class B star. So class B stars. Class B are main sequence stars that are very bright and blue. Although somewhat rare, the luminosity of these stars makes them among the most visible to the naked eye. How's that for a colorful star? Okay, let's change it to a class A star. So class A's, these are relatively young white or blush white main sequence stars are typically among the most visible to the naked eye. They are large and rotate very quickly, but will eventually evolve into slower and cooler red giants. Uh, we'll go to a class F star. These are looking more familiar. F-type stars are fairly large and often referred to as yellow-white dwarfs, although they are very, they very often emit significant amounts of UV, UV radiation. Their wide habitable zones have a good chance of supporting life-bearing worlds. So there you go. If you find a system with a class F star, chances are there's going to be planets in that system that, uh, that you're going to be able to inhabit. And next up is a G star. Often referred to as yellow dwarfs, the G-type stars range in color from white to slightly yellow. Main sequence stars fuse hydrogen for roughly 10 billion years before they expand and become red giants, although their lifespans are shorter than K-type stars. Worlds inside the habitable zones of G-type stars often enjoy optimal conditions for the development of life. So again, you may end up with more Gaia worlds appearing in class G systems. Uh, next up is a K star. Uh, that 
one, I think. Yeah, there we go. These main sequence stars, sometimes referred to as orange dwarfs, are a fairly common sight. They are stable on the main sequence for up to 30 billion years, meaning that worlds orbiting K stars have a longer than average window to evolve life. There we go. Uh, and the last of the normal stars. is M stars. The most common stars in the universe, often referred to as red dwarfs, their low luminosity means they are difficult to observe with the naked eye from afar. Although they typically have an extremely long lifespan, red dwarfs emit almost no UV light, resulting in unfavorable conditions for most forms of life. Um, you do generally get mineral rich um, class M systems, I have noticed. Uh, so now we go to the unique ones. So we have, first of all, the black holes. There we go. Typically formed as a result of the collapse of a very massive star at the end of its life cycle, black holes have extremely long, uh, sorry, extremely strong gravity fields that prevent anything, including light, from escaping once the event horizon has been crossed. That looks really cool. Uh, we have the neutron stars. Again, very cool looking. These incredibly dense so stellar remnants are sometimes created when a massive star suffers a rapid collapse and explodes in a supernova. Although their diameter is typically as little as 10 kilometers, their mass is many times greater than an average G-type star. Looks so cool. And last, by no means least, we go back to what it was at the start, a pulsar. Pulsars are highly magnetized neutron stars that emit beams of electromagnetic radiation. As the star rotates, the ro radiation beam is only visible when the pointing directly at the observer. This results in a very precise interval of pulses, which sometimes is so exact that it can be used to measure the passage of time with extreme accuracy. Here we go. And those are all the types of star and planet that you will come across.